You're watching FISM News. After the coronavirus crisis, safe, reliable, and affordable changes to current work practices will be essential for economic recovery in the U.S. That's according to what Richmond Federal Reserve President Thomas Barkin said on Monday. Businesses are already refocusing on resilience, perhaps at the expense of efficiency. Increased debt loads, reduced bank lending capacity, and diminished confidence has to have a meaningful impact on investment levels. He added, even if economic growth resumes later this year, the more systemic damage left behind may need further government attention to restore consumer confidence or encourage investment. Barkin said, over time, we will return to somewhat normal operations at a gradual pace. But I worry about the landing spot, how strong the economy will be at the end of this. In a post on the Richmond Fed's website, Barkin also said that new productivity investments will need some government incentive to restore confidence in such an uncertain environment. Officials say President Trump is turbocharging a new supply chain initiative that aims to punish Beijing for its handling of the coronavirus outbreak. The initiative will apparently remove global industrial supply chains from China as it weighs new tariffs. Ripple effects from the coronavirus pandemic are now driving a government-wide push to move U.S. production and supply chain dependency away from China. According to senior U.S. administration officials, even moving that dependency onto friendly nations instead would be a win for the U.S. Keith Kroc, who works in the energy branch of the State Department, said, We've been working on reducing the reliance of our supply chains in China over the last few years, but we are now turbocharging that initiative. The U.S. Commerce Department, state, and other agencies are looking for ways to push companies to move both sourcing and manufacturing out of China. Tax incentives and potential reshoring subsidies are among measures being considered to spur changes. More than a dozen children have been hospitalized due to a mysterious illness which officials are saying has potential ties to COVID-19. In a bulletin put out by the health department, the Deputy Commissioner of Disease Control detailed a pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome that's been found in 15 patients ages 2 to 15. All of these cases were reported within the last three weeks. The bulletin also describes the symptoms as being similar to toxic shock syndrome or Kawasaki disease. All patients experienced some level of fever. More than half the patients reported a rash, abdominal pain, vomiting, or diarrhea. New York is the first state in the U.S. to identify and report cases of this mysterious syndrome, but Europe has already seen several cases as well. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani threatened a crushing response on Wednesday if the United States extends an embargo on Iranian trade of conventional arms, which the United Nations is set to lift later this year. Under Iran's deal with world powers to limit its nuclear program in return for lifting sanctions, a U.N. weapons embargo is due to expire in October. The United States, which exited the deal in 2018, says it would like to extend the embargo. Iran has gradually rolled back its accord commitments in response to the U.S. decision to quit. However, Iran says it wants the agreement to remain in place overall. Rouhani said Iran's nuclear steps are reversible if other parties to the deal fulfill their obligations and preserve Tehran's interests under the pact. Police are looking into what they call an apparent murder or suicide involving a University of Pittsburgh professor. According to the university, the research assistant professor, identified as Bing Lu, was on the verge of making very significant findings in COVID-19 research. Lu was found in his townhouse Saturday with multiple gunshot wounds. Police say that an unnamed man, who was later found dead in his car, shot and killed Lou in his home before getting back in his car and taking his own life. According to Detective Sergeant Brian Kolhep, police believe the men knew each other. In a statement honoring Lou, his colleagues at the university's Department of Computational and Systems Biology said he was on the verge of making very significant findings towards understanding the cellular mechanisms that underlie SARS-CoV-2 infection and the cellular basis of the following complications. As the global pandemic takes its toll on the business, Uber Technologies has decided to make some cutbacks. The company announced on Wednesday that it will cut about 3,700 full-time jobs. Also, Chief Executive Officer Dara Kasar Shahi will forgo his base salary for the remainder of the year. The company said layoffs included its customer support and recruiting teams. 
Uber expects to incur about $20 million in costs for severance and related charges. But Uber operates in more markets around the world than their competitor, Lyft, and they could recover some lost revenue with their food delivery business. Lyft will report its quarterly results on Wednesday after market hours, and Uber is expected to report earnings on Thursday. Uber shares opened 3% lower on Wednesday. Afghan authorities say they have recovered 17 bodies of migrants who were thrown into a river by Iranian border guards to stop them from entering the country. Iran has already rejected the allegations, but the case has triggered a diplomatic crisis between the neighboring countries, who share trade as well as economic and cultural ties. Afghan officials and survivors now say a group of about 50 men from the Harat province were trying to enter Iran. This group was detained by its border guards and later forced into the Harirud River shared between Iran, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan. Abdul Ghani Nouri is the governor of Guran district of Herat. On Thursday, Nouri said that a preliminary investigation showed that the migrants were thrown into the river at gunpoint in Iran. Afghanistan's foreign ministry said that Tehran has agreed to jointly investigate the incident to determine the facts and identity of the perpetrators. Data from the British government's Office for National Statistics came out this week supporting studies in other Western nations that say non-white ethnic groups have been hit worse by the new coronavirus. According to the study's adjusted models, males of Bangladeshi and Pakistani ethnicities were 1.8 times more likely to die, and females from those groups 1.6 times. Black people were 1.9 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than the white ethnic group. Individuals from Chinese and mixed ethnic groups have similar risks to white people. The ONS report said, The difference between ethnic groups and COVID-19 mortality is partly a result of socioeconomic disadvantage and other circumstances, but a remaining part of the difference has not yet been explained. Occupation may be a factor in the disproportionate deaths. Britain's health ministry said about the data, It is critical we find out which groups are more at risk so we can take the right steps to protect them and minimize their risk. A Georgia County prosecutor said on Tuesday he would ask grand jury to decide if charges should be filed against a former law enforcement officer and his son in the fatal shooting of an unarmed young black man as he ran through a small town. The shooting of 25-year-old Ahmud Aubrey outside Brunswick, Georgia, in February was captured on videotape and posted on social media this week. The graphic footage has stirred outrage over the reluctance of prosecutors to file charges against the two men. Gregory McMichael, and his son, Travis. According to a letter obtained by The Times, the prosecutors in Brunswick argued there was not probable cause to arrest the McMichaels because they were legally carrying firearms, had a right to pursue a suspect, and use deadly force to protect themselves. You can read more about the incident on FISM.tv news. We have an article there with all the details explained. The U.S. economy lost a staggering 20.5 million jobs in April. It's another sign of how the novel coronavirus pandemic is battering the world's biggest economy. The government released a report this week showing the unemployment rate surging to 14.7% last month. For context, this percentage is nearly 4% above the post-World War II record of 10.8%. The government said in a note attached to its report that the true unemployment rate may be closer to 19.5%. And that figure does not even count people whose hours were cut sharply due to the virus or who couldn't look for work because of stay-at-home orders. The unemployment rate has long been an indicator of the health of the economy, shrinking when jobs are plentiful and rising when times get hard. But it does have its gaps in accuracy. Another wave of states prepared to ease coronavirus restrictions on U.S. commerce this week, despite health experts warning there is still too little diagnostic testing to have control of the spread. Colorado, Mississippi, Minnesota, Montana, and Tennessee were set to join several other states in reopening businesses without the means to screen systematically for asymptomatic infections or perform contact tracing. Michigan and California, two U.S. manufacturing powerhouses, will allow factories to reopen over the next few days as millions more Americans join the ranks of workers left jobless by the pandemic. For example, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer gave the go-ahead to manufacturers to restart on May 11th, which will allow thousands to go back to work. Thank you for watching. This has been FISM News.